What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Change of a Podcast. My name is Jody. If you're new to the channel, you can support us by liking the video and comment down below which guests you think we should have on um, coming up. I'm in Dallas this week. Just a heads up, this episode was recorded a few weeks ago. Um, next week, we head to Michigan where we're going to sit down with Cannon Kingsley at the 25 at Michigan State. Um, but yeah, all is good on, on our end. Justin is finally healthy again, playing tournaments. Evan's back in the U.S., so I'm sure you'll be seeing more of him. And I've been doing doing what I've been doing on on tour. So, yeah. Uh, if you, again, if you're new here, welcome. If if you've been supporting us for since last April, since we started, thank you. Um, yeah. Hope you enjoy the episode. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Change Over Podcast. My name is Jody. This is Justin. Um, we are here in at home in Florida, leaving to futures tomorrow. So, just. Figured we get a little episode in, connect with you guys. Um, if this is your first time here, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any of the episodes and like and comment down below. That helps with engagement, helps share us. Too. Yeah, share it with people who you think would be interested in hearing about um, about tennis and professional tennis and that sort of stuff. And also, if you're interested in sponsoring any of the episodes, you can email us. Um, we have our email in the description down below or you can always comment or, or DM us on Instagram. There's plenty of ways to reach out to us. But yeah, let's get into the episode. Um, we're just going to talk about, I guess, a few more shout outs really or highlights if you want to call them. We have a name for this seg- segment, Justin? A name for this segment? Yeah. Um, not really, but we we come with one for the next episode. Yeah, but... Basically, I guess Justin messaged me a few weeks ago and figured that, you know, we we talked about Segerman and Patrick Trach, Trach, him, Trach, them, um, and people seem to be pretty interested interested about that on Instagram when we talked about how these guys, how they did very well in the futures and the challenges and then they like weren't really breaking into the 250s without some wild cards and these guys are now top 100. So we saw that you guys enjoyed, I guess, that discussion. Um, and we figured we'd do some highlights of some players that, you know, some results that people may not really think about. So the first one that we're going to talk about is Jazz Hussey. Um, at the beginning of the year, Jazz Hussey, in March, um, he went on a run where he won three 15Ks in a row and semied the last one. And in the last one, he had to retire hurt in the one that he semied. Can you see where he started ranked? Oh, no. Or it doesn't show up on the... Where well, he started the year? Yeah. He started at 443. Okay. So he started at 443. Um, He was doing okay. Like, maybe he lost three or four in a row to start the year. And was doing okay until March. And then March, he just went on a tear, winning some 15Ks. Tunisia, right? In Egypt and then Tunisia. Oh, both? Yeah, he won, I believe, the first two he won. Spain first. So he won Spain, then he won Egypt, then he won Tunisia, and then he was in the semis of Tunisia okay. where he pulled out. I believe he hurt his knee. Um, And I guess the reason that we're highlighting him is... I don't really know why we're highlighting him, really. Oh, he had a pretty cool run story. at... At the grass court tournaments in, in Eastbourne. In yeah. Eastbourne. But he did well. Yeah, Eastbourne. So, out of 250. Ah, that's right. He beat Navone. That's why we're out of him. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you saw what? I am sick, so <laughs> forgive me. Um, yeah, I guess the point of this, Giles, and also transition into Fernley, Billy Harris, and these guys is how well these guys play on grass. Like well, English well, guys play on where grass. did he end up right after all those futures wins? Do you, can you see that? Like right now, yeah, three hundred and sixty. His live is going to be three hundred and ten after. He's going to be three hundred and ten after East one. Okay, so I guess after Wimbledon or something. Whenever Wimbledon is done, he's going to be three hundred and ten. But he beat Navone and then he lost to Koboli in three sets, six four in the third. Koboli has a chance there. Forty nine and forty nine in the world. Yeah. So, yeah. Um. So you just see like how important the services are. I feel like right starting the summer, you see. The British guys doing very well. You had Charles Broom, final challenger. You had Jacob Friendly, who won the NCAAs with TCU. He won the challenger in, in Nottingham. Then you saw Billy Harris. I want to say he made quarters in Queens and then semis in Eastbourne. Um, Job, 
I think he made semis. I could be wrong. I think he lost to the Bilo. Job. Oh, job. In um, okay. Mallorca on grass. Okay. So it's just, you see how important surfaces are because those results are not necessarily typical of some of those names. And when you think about, when we talk about like the greatest player of all time discussions, we talk about how many slabs they won, but we don't really speak about the surfaces, I feel like. Because if the schedule was flipped and you had two slams on clay, I feel like Rafa might have 40 slams right now. And we mm-hmm. might we might look at it a little bit differently. But um, yeah, it's cool to see these guys having these runs. I think for Fernley, I think it's cool just to ride that momentum. Even Pennington Jones did well, I think, too. And he got a wild card for Wimbledon as well. He's also on the TCU team there. Um, but yeah, man, I think Surfaces are huge. I think you probably feel it in your own game when you've played tournaments. Like, if you've been on a surface that you like, I think the results probably go more in your favor if the conditions suit you. And, yeah, these guys probably grew up playing on more grass courts than maybe anywhere else in the world. Maybe Australia has some grass, but I don't know too many places where people actually grow up learning how to move and play and compete on, on grass courts. Like, I never played on grass in my life. I think even grass aside, also, like, indoors... Like, the indoor futures and challenges in England are always, yeah. like, you look at the list and maybe there's some guys that are further down in the rankings. Mm-hmm. Like, let's say you look at an English guy that's further down in the rankings. Like, Billy Harris, I guess, at the time when he's getting these wild cards into the 250s and stuff, the, the rest of the field is looking at him like he's lower down the rankings, but he's been playing on grass mm-hmm. probably every year. Yeah. Same I- thing as the indoors. Like, these English guys, yeah. you know, it's a futures. You see a guy ranked in the thousands or unranked and... The, the number is kind of low. But they're also they're home there home yeah, as well. They're all the time. So. They're home. So, like, you see it too, for example, in a country like Italy. They have so many guys in top 100 now, but they can basically go through all levels of tennis without leaving home. Like they probably have, they have a lot of good junior tournaments, and then they have a lot of futures. Then they have a lot of challenges, and you see these guys kind of... Uh, they say go through the phases pretty quick, some of them. So I think having that at home and being from England, having a slam like Wimbledon is a is a huge help. So yeah, shout out to those guys and yeah, good luck at Wimbledon. But um, yeah. Um, next things, I just want to give a few shout outs. So the first one, I want to say personally, thank you to the Wise family in Tulsa. I played Tulsa two weeks ago. Um, and shout out to Josh for for connecting this, but. Basically, I mean, as a lot of you guys know, most times that we go to Futures, it's a pretty big expense for us, so housing goes a long way, and the Wise family helped me in Tulsa, stayed by them, they took care of me and took care of Oscar as well, so a special thank you to you. And then, before we get too much into the episode, also I want to give a shout out to my friend um, Liam Evans. So Liam played football or soccer for the Americans at my university um and he also started his podcast i want to say maybe three or four months ago and he's about 10 episodes in if you guys are interested in strength and conditioning he hosts a a bunch of other people in that space um just learning how to get take care of your body be professional athletes or build or you know empower youth athletes and that sort of stuff so um yeah check out the athletic edge podcast on youtube and then also another shout out is Amy Zoo. Zoo. Yeah, Amy Zoo. <laughs> um, you guys probably know Amy Zoo from the other episodes before. She's been on maybe two episodes, I think, of us. Um, and it's Evan's sister. And she also started her YouTube channel. We should get her views, boy. Yeah, that short. She's doing better than us. So she needs to give us a, a shout 5, out. 5,000 views on the short? Yeah. She used to teach us how to make some content. But yeah, go to YouTube and search <laughs> Amy Zoo 200. Um, and subscribe to her channel and follow her journey as well. So, yeah, good to see that Amy's doing that too. Um, um, next thing, so I don't know if you saw recently that the ATP announced that they approved in competition in competition wearables. That's like to record, like like the Whoop, for example. Do you see that or no? Have you seen? I it? saw an email, but I yeah, exactly. So we got the email and then. Um, there was a tweet from the Sports Business Journal 
ATP Tour announces in competition wearable use set to use catapult and start sports devices. Is that what they use like in, in football? Like they have they wear the thing and it tracks their steps and stuff? Yes, but I believe and I don't know too much about it, so if you guys know more about it, comment down below and, and teach us. But the reason why I brought this up is because when I saw this, I was like, oh, like in my mind, I was like, oh, finally, like people can just wear the tracking devices or whatever. But apparently it's not like I can't just go out and wear my own. It's for the ATP. And I think you have to pay for the service and mm -hmm. they um, they track it or whatever. So, OK, I'll show, I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you. I'll show you. I'll show you what. So let's read the thing. It says the ATP has approved the use of in-competition wearable devices from Catapult and Stat Sports across matches on the Tour and Challenger levels beginning 15th of July. Blah, 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 blah. Um, and it says, it's not something we want to commercialize for the time being. It's not something to make money. There's not too many details from this. I wish I should have probably brought up the email, but the reason why I brought this up is because Pospisil and Andy Roddick both tweeted back and they were basically complaining about why can't they use their own devices? Why is it a um, set device from from the mm -hmm. ATP? And like, what does the information go? Like, are they able to use the information for themselves and that sort of stuff? Um, it's a valid point, the second point, I think. So the, the pastor still said, um, his second point is tennis players are supposedly independent contractors. Why then is it mandatory that all of the data be centralized in the tennis IQ? Will it will it be or is it already connected to the ATP and ATP's media joint venture with the TDI? TDI is who commercializes data in tennis, including betting, media, and performance. Is that the end goal? Um, eager to get answers to these basic questions soon. As we saw, this was also funny too. As we saw with the ATP's baseline program, which was marketed as transformative, the devil is in the detail. Ironically, most players Pospisil has spoken to has declined to participate in the baseline program once they read the fine print. Hmm. I wish I knew what that even, that fine print was. Because when we talked about the baseline program yeah. and how it didn't really make sense. Yeah. Um, but I guess, according to Pospisil. Um, yeah, but I'm kind of with him. Like, all this time, yeah, we do this stuff on our own. We're paying for where we travel and all this stuff. And if, we have our own teams and our own ways of gathering information. I think it should be fair that I track things that I want to track, how I want to track them. If you're letting tracking be allowed, then what's the issue if I yeah. wear a whoop and that's what I want to do? I don't think At first, when I saw that, that's how I thought it was. I thought that we can just use the our own devices and track what we want, mm -hmm. but apparently it's... Um, it's the specific one. So this is I think that would make sense too if they were giving it for free. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this is what Roddick said. There are some issues here. Using a tour player's data, supposedly independent contractors, which the players will somehow be compensated, right? And since this is approved, I'm assuming players can choose to use their own wearables and not just the one the tour has made mandatory with the deal. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like if it's, Free, they might have more leeway, but the fact that they're, if it's free and optional, I would, that would make sense. But if it's, I have to pay for it and I can't use my own, then it's kind of weird to me. Like, what do they need data for? I don't know. You asked me, like, that's when you asked me about the football day. It's like, I believe that the football players, the clubs, um, use that, you know, mm -hmm. to track, like, how much they're running and all this Prevent stuff. injuries and stuff like that. Exactly. That's I'm sure sense. they have to report some of it back to the league that the clubs are in. But, like, yeah. I think the club can just do do it how they want to do it. Like, use it for whatever they want to. Yeah. I don't know how this stuff... Do you feel like the, the things even helped you? The whoop? Yes. In what way? Like, I can see... Uh, I think sleep is the biggest one. Just to see, like, because sometimes... You don't realize, like, when you're losing out on sleep. Like, when you're, like, I think I'm going to sleep at a certain time, and it shows that I'm not falling asleep until a little bit later. Or let's say I feel like I go to sleep at 10 o'clock, and the whoop shows I didn't go to sleep until, like, 11, 15 or something. You know, like, 
I think that's the biggest thing. It shows when you get in bad habits. Like that's what I, for me at least, I've been losing sleep that way. So then also change and also stress. Like it's shown the matches that, like I, I've, it shows like stress levels. You know, so like sometimes I play matches. Like I think when I was in Tunisia and then when I was going on the run in Mexico and Jamaica, my stress was low. So then in other matches where I'm not. Maybe if I'm not that confident, it shows my stress is a little bit higher. Maybe it, then I, I learn, like, okay, maybe I was a little bit tense in these matches. I need to try to practice. This is stuff that you, or something. that you don't feel on your own? No. Stress? Yeah, like, I, I felt, like, I don't nece- I didn't necessarily feel a big difference in the three sets in Tulsa that I lost than one of the ones in Tunisia or Mexico. Like, it Which felt, felt the same. Clear difference? Yeah, I can see a clear difference. Like, the stress level is way higher. And I knew before that match I wasn't, not that I wasn't confident, but like, I don't know. I, in the run, it's like I, every day, the next day, I play a match, next day I play a match, next day I play a match. And then I took the break of like two weeks. So now I took two weeks off after just winning a few tournaments. And it's like, I kind of want to keep going. Mm-hmm. You know, like, even in between the run, then when I won two in a row, I felt relief when I lost. Because, like, every day as the run went on and on and on, it's like, which day is it going to come that I want to lose? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just going to win every single match. And then when that happened, I, I relaxed. And then, obviously, you just won two in a row. One hurt is not, one loss is not going to hurt you. So then I was still calm going into the next tournament that I won. And then this one in Tulsa, there was a little bit of uncertainty. And, yeah, the stress was way high. Like, even in the practice. Like, the practice, because I guess if I'm not feeling that great, you want to try harder and... Sometimes you don't really need to try harder. You're already doing everything you're supposed to do. Um, but what are examples of things that you've had to change to get, let's say, better readings on the on the wolf, like in sleep or with stress? Like, are there any habits that you can say for sure lead to you having a better no outcome? No. Uh, well, there's things that you can look at, like little things. Like, so every day you put a journal. Okay. So I know the certain things don't really have a big impact. Like, for example, one of the things I have on my journal is caffeine. Like, it shows every morning if I drink coffee. That shows, according to the WHOOP, it's like a 1% difference. Like, it doesn't really change. But then maybe there are other people who, if they use caffeine, maybe it makes a big difference, whatever. Um, I don't think... So, like, when you sleep bad, there's nothing you can point to to be like, that's the reason why? No, not yet, not yet. I'm not not to my knowledge at least um but to me the biggest thing is just stress it's like just learning like like which matches give me stress and when I'm feeling this way like now I can associate like what, how I was feeling in Tulsa and after the match I looked at it and I saw the numbers were high so it's like maybe I don't feel it in the moment but if I practice just like maybe breathing or being more loose because then also it impacts the way I play. Like I was telling Chris that in big moments, I try to be more physical, but then when I try to be more physical, it almost works the opposite. Like mm-hmm. my feet get too heavy on the ground. So I almost need to be lighter, like try to be lighter. So that's one of the focuses in training recently is like, because when, when I'm playing well, I don't really have to think. You're just in the flow state. And then when I try to, I mean, when I'm a little bit nervous, when I'm a little... I guess uncomfortable and I try hard my feet get heavy on the ground because I want to push off and be explosive or something and I'm already tall like I don't really have to be too explosive like I can just cover the net by being calm and being light like I can be I can be late to a ball and use my reach and put it away this mm-hmm. way or put it away that way I don't have to be like in the perfect position every single time because um, that's my thing I don't like the idea of something necessarily telling me how I should feel today like I, yeah. I don't know if that gets in your mind at all. But I don't check like, it first thing in the morning. Okay. I don't like I check it, especially when I train early, like seven o'clock or eight o'clock. I don't I don't check it until midday. Sometimes until the, even the evening. Like, mm-hmm. um, but it's good. Like it showed me in Tunisia when I was sleeping in bed. It showed me like this week I've been sick all week. And but you wouldn't have known you were sleeping bad. Like you know, yeah, but I but it, I wouldn't. Like, the recovery was shocking, like, on some of those nights. Like, shockingly low, like, in Tunisia. So, um, it shows, like, also in the journal, you can put, like, 
travel. Like it shows how traveling. Like I'm sure if I can bring. Let me see if I can pull it up. Ew. Yeah. So a consistent bedtime increases my recovery by eight percent. Um, and a consistent wake time increases it by five percent. Um, travel decreases my recovery by three percent. Stress decreases it by four percent. And there's like a strain scale, so like how hard you work in a day up to twenty one. If I'm past a sixteen, I recover worse. Mm-hmm. And then what's the highest? Highest what? Restrain. Twenty one. Guess what alcohol uh, affects you? Like how much percent works? 50. No, not that much. 16%. According to this, and I haven't drank that much. I think I drank maybe no more than 10 times this whole year. Mm. So. But I believe that the, the alcohol one, that one's kind of tricky on this app because that one is also paired with no sleep, you know? Like the nights that I drink is the nights that I oh, up late. Mm. So, yeah, like, I don't know how many of these times that I just have one or two drinks and then go to sleep or something mm. on time. But, um, but, yeah, I think I think it's interesting. Caffeine only helps me recover 2% more. So, it's minimal. Hey, guys, quick break. Justin here from The Changeover. I'm going to talk about Pro Stringer. It's a great machine that I use, Jody uses, and a lot of other pros use as well. You can use it at home, on the road, Really anywhere there's a tabletop surface. It takes me about 25-30 minutes to string a racket on this machine. It is easy to travel with. Fits in carry-on, suitcase, tennis bag. No issues at TSA. It's a big money saver. And you can save even more when you use our code CHANGEOVER to get $100 off the machine. Back to the episode. Um, we have a couple of scenarios for you. Go for it. I'd like you to know... I'd like to know how you rack these in terms of annoyance. So you're stringing a racket and you finish the mains and you're like halfway through the crosses. Or let's say you're at the, the tie in the knot and it and it pops. How does that compare to driving all the way to practice? The reason you like lift your shoes at home, you have no shoes. And then having a practice partner cancel practice on you last minute. Like you're ready there and then they text you, we, I'm not going to make it. What's the most annoying? Uh, maybe stringing is the most annoying. By far. It'll make you like contemplate like. Not on the pro stringer though. <laughs> we love stringing on our pro stringer. Get $100 off. Code change over. Um, yeah, no, that's the worst. When you almost finish stringing the racket, you make a mistake and it breaks. Or like you you reach the end of the racket and you count it wrong and now you can't tie a knot. Yeah, it's too short. Oh too my bad. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I have this new rackets and this like, I was trying to like, still use, use the string in them and there's a little bit more of an open string pattern so I'm popping a bit more and I had it the other night. Like, you went to bed and I was oh, chilling. I, heard. I was chilling. <laughs> and I got halfway, almost three quarters with the cross and the machine, well, I don't know, me or the machine, the string popped. And I took like a fifteen minute break. Like I, I, I cursed very loud. I thought I thought that you were gonna just go to sleep when that happened. No, I I practiced at night, I wasn't gonna wake up and then string and then go. Yeah. So for me for sure, strings the worst one. Uh leaving my shoes, I don't know if that maybe that might it would be annoying, but it wouldn't be the worst. If someone cancelled it on me after I really made it though, it would make me upset. Especially if I don't have any other options. So I think maybe my shoes would be lost. But someone cancelled on me might be second. True. Is that in the video or no? No. It is only And then we're talking about communication. What's worse? Getting a call with, or getting a text from someone saying, call me when you get a chance? Or a hey with no other information? Or an acquaintance sending you a one minute random voice note? Someone you're not that close to, but they just, the problem I don't know what's in your voice note. It's like, just tell me. Like, just tell me. Give me the info so I can... Yeah. Uh, I don't like a yo. I don't like a hey. It's like, just let's... Uh, you can greet. Hello. But get to the point as well. Yeah. Uh, call me what? Call me when you get the chance is the best one. It's the worst one. Call me when you get the chance? Yeah. Oh, no contact. No contact. Oh, yeah. Call me when you get a chance. Yeah. 
You don't know if it's bad news, good news. I'm bad with the voice notes. I'm bad with the voice notes. Like, sometimes I see a voice note and I just know that that's just going to sit. Like, so here's my thing. I need to be better. Comedy get just me is worse just as a sheer annoyance of them thinking that I should just call them when they want to talk to me. That gets to me. I don't like that at all. But I'm going to put the voice note as worse than the hey. Because if I listen to the voice note, you see, you see it blue. Like let's you go, know I listen to let's it. Let's go back to the comedy when you get a chance yeah. for it. Th- that's not why it bothers me. Like, I just need to know contact. Like, I'll call you when I get the chance. It's stressful that. for me. I that's what's, what's stressful is that I don't know why. It's okay. twofold for me. I don't mind. I don't mind. It's twofold. I don't mind calling. Because it's like, I know that you're busy, whatever, but. And just say what the call is about as well. Like, why is that hard? I want to talk to you about X, Y, Z. Then I'll call you. But uh, it's a random call when you get a chance. It makes me very upset. And then the voice note thing, if I listen to it, on WhatsApp it turns blue. And then on the iMessage it says, like, kept or whatever. Yeah. So I don't want that pressure of if I hear it, I have to respond. <laughs> so the hey is the least one for me because I could just answer what I feel like. But, yeah. The That's- problem is, is if I get that from a cer- from certain people, like family members, I get concerned. You know, like... That scares me the most. Yeah, exactly. Hey, call me. Yeah. Why? What happened? <laughs> What's going on? What happened? Yeah, I hate that so much. Exactly. Yeah. But anyway. Facts. All right. Get into some of the last episodes. Good. So we had two, in my opinion, very good, very insightful episodes. We had Nicolas Moreno de Alboran from... Wherever he's from, Dominican, Spain, That's cool. England, US, <laughs> but very good tennis player. I think he's as high as 120 something, 130 something in the world. Uh, he's probably 97. Good tennis player, very good tennis player, won two Challenger titles. And we also had on Taylor Townsend. She's been as high as five in the world in doubles, and I want to say 50 something in singles. Uh, but these were Zoom episodes. They, they didn't get as many views as we would have liked. Because I actually think the information inside those episodes is very good. Um, I liked... Yeah, that's another thing. Also, let us know if you're still watching up until this point. It hasn't been that long, only 30 minutes. But um, let us know if you guys like the Zoom episodes. Like, is the quality okay? Do you guys like it? Would you guys rather us do more in-person ones? I mean, that's that's the goal for us is we prefer the, the in-person episodes. But, like... We don't always have access to guests just because of the nature of the sport. You know how we are and how dynamic everyone's schedule is. Um, so that's why we're here today. Um, just us just getting an episode in by ourselves. But um, let us know if you like the Zoom episodes, if you guys think that we should continue with the Zoom ones in the weeks so we don't have a guest in person. Yeah. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, but when it comes to that, I think we need to find a program that... We can capture the guest better so we can make it more dynamic. I feel like I feel like the way it's set up on the screen might not be the most maybe engaging way to watch something. If you people are watching. Saying that Reese is not doing a good job. Not I'm, saying that, saying. I'm saying that Zoom isn't the best way to capture a podcast is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Uh, I think we can probably find a better, I don't know, medium for it or a better app or whatever. Uh, maybe me getting a camera as well on the road would be helpful. Um... So I've seen other podcasts where they do that, like in basketball or even tennis with the Andy Roddick's thing, and it's it's not perfect. Obviously, being in person is better, but I think that it can be it can be done in a in a pretty good way. Uh, I think we're gonna probably need to do it if we're gonna get certain guests on, especially when we don't have Miami Open every week here, or we're not necessarily at the same tournaments as those people. But uh, I thought that the, the talks were very good. I was pretty. She almost. Taylor sold me on the idea of how doubles could be good for your overall tennis game, even if it's singles or whatever, when she was talking about how stressful moments or stressful moments, whether it's in in singles or doubles. Like the main big points. Yeah, like if you're in a deuce point or a break point or you're trying to serve a set out, you're still under stress. And it can even arguably arguably be worse or more stress because you have someone, someone that calling on you as well um so i thought about that i thought that was pretty cool how she was saying the skill doesn't necessarily translate in terms of let's say in doubles you have tighter windows to return into and i think it's maybe return more down the middle you have more freedom with that but the 
the mental emotional application of what it takes to let's say succeed in Burn. in uh well to to excel in um <laughs> To excel in those situations under pressure is is this is a similar feeling. It's the same kind of feeling. So I, I think it's pretty cool that she uses her doubles to even help her keep improving in the singles in the singles game. And even that she says she doesn't even train doubles. She just trains singles, and she happens to be very good at doubles. She said, "I'm just fat." That's what she said. She said what? Fire. She's just fat. Oh, that's what she said. <laughs> we both missed it in the episode, by the way. She said, that? She said that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's that's the zoom for you. Yeah. But uh yeah, I thought it was a, a pretty good conversation. And she was very fun and, and she was cool. So if you didn't like watching it, maybe at least listen to it on Spotify. I thought that the it was one of the better conversations in terms of um information and also banter and humor. I thought it was I thought it was good. Um as I think but yeah going back to the point of letting the doubles confidence transfer to singles. So you have to apply it, though, because this happened to me where I've been pressing a lot of my doubles returns and I've been aggressive on the doubles returns. Yeah. But then when I step onto the singles court, it's like, now I have all this space. So now I'm not being as aggressive and now I'm putting balls in, but they don't have quality. Yeah. You know, so you have to have the same, I guess, mentality that you're going to do something like be proactive and not just no because you have a bigger area you can be safer with the ball like just still be aggressive and yeah you have to apply the same yeah. thing yeah yeah and speaking of doubles what is the funniest way you've been asked to play doubles yeah I don't think I've been asked any funny ways I received rumors but I have not heard any funny ways I, rece- I mean I've not been asked re- any funny ways I received a DM from someone I don't know I guess he's playing the tournament next week he says hello bro I see you are also playing the M25 Laval. Let's play doubles together. Let me know so I can sign us in. He says, I serve very well with lots of power, spin, and effects, and I run very fast. And he puts running emojis in the in the smoke. <laughs> did you say yes? I didn't answer him yet. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say no. I'm playing with Oscar already, but you should have said yes. I've never physically served so well with spins and effects. She said he does. <laughs> I've never heard Oscar say that he serves with effects. So it must be true. I know I've never been sold on a. Uh, I've been like someone tried to sell to me the. Uh, if that doesn't sell you, I don't know what will. It, it won't. And then another one I got a random one today, not doubles, but the guy just said, "Hey Justin, just had a look over your highlights. Let's link up and get some sessions going." <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> I mean, he wants to practice. Can I see this one? Who is this? <laughs> someone named Adam. But oh, you don't know Adam. Oh, random is that? Shout out to Adam. <laughs> you have a podcast, bro. You're getting famous. That's why. Yeah. Why Adam didn't DM me? Adam, you want to get any sessions going with me? Yeah. But anyway, um, so I thought the Taylor episode was very good. And then the Albron episode I thought was also very good. Um, he had some pretty cool insights on training with Rafa and, and Djokovic. How Nadal's style of training is much more, it seems like, carefree in terms of errors and um, just kind of the way he reacts to mistakes versus when he played with Joke, which he felt that like the guy was much more accurate and less errors, maybe not hitting the ball quite as freely, but he was still, um, he was just much more focused in a different way, I guess, than Rafa was. And then he also, we had some pretty cool talks about tactics and playing to your identity and if and when you should be... Um, let's say, adjusting your style to be tactical versus just playing your strengths, which I thought was pretty interesting coming from a guy who plays sort of similar to the way that I play. Talked about serving tactics and stuff like that. So I think definitely check that episode out. I think it was also very good. Um, and yeah, I hope hope we can get some some more players of that caliber and, and higher so we can keep learning from, I guess, our, I don't call them pairs or whatever, but... I enjoyed this episode a lot, uh, personally. Um, but we'll also do the same. We At tournaments, we'll do the futures ones, and we'll have the banter and the same kind of stuff we've, we've been doing. But I like those episodes. It's funny because, like, I don't I don't necessarily enjoy the Zoom ones any less than I enjoy the in-person ones. Mm-hmm. I just know that because of Zoom, like, they could... It's hard to control the quality, mm-hmm. you know, so we don't know 
how the Wi-Fi is going to be, how the camera quality is going to be, how the microphone quality, maybe the jokes don't hit the same and whatever. Um, I don't enjoy them any less, though. Like, they're still fun. Like, I still enjoy, like, coming on and doing the podcast. Um, but obviously, it's, it's challenging to, you know, like we said, like, keep it in person and keep it also on schedule. Like, we're a little bit ha- hand- handcuffed with, like, um, with the scheduling of episodes. So, yeah, again, if you guys would like to um help out in any way to to sponsor any of the episodes or if you just like to help out also by the way it's the end of june and we're gonna take the um this is the probably the last chance to get your merch so um then we're gonna take it down for a little bit and then come back at some point with a season two so if you haven't gotten merch and you want to grab a shirt a hoodie um whatever you want go quickly because we're about to take it down um but yeah, that's pretty much all we have for today. You have anything else to cover, Justin? Well, we leave to go to Montreal tomorrow. There's a 25K in Canada. I guess it'll be my first official tournament back since my injury. Um, I, oh, you want to talk about Davis Cup a little bit? Or? I played Davis Cup two weeks ago, a week ago. Yeah, last week. Uh, I played four matches. I didn't get any wins, but I played two guys around 300 in the world. My first match, I played a college guy from Costa Rica, lost six in the third, I had too much points. And then I lost in three sets to Ricardo Rodriguez, six, four in the third. Uh, but after not being able to hold the racket for three months, and then I trained about three and a half weeks, um, it was just nice to to be able to play. And I think it was a pretty good practice week for me in terms of having uh, matches with a lot of pressure and pretty high level opponents. I actually had some pretty good stretches of tennis there where I was up breaks in a lot of sets against those guys 300. So I felt like my level was pretty high, but I just wasn't that, um, what's the word? I lacked a little bit of discipline in certain moments and then a little bit of conviction, I think. I was maybe surprising myself how well I was playing at times. And I wasn't necessarily, I think, ready for that moment. But um, yeah, I just just very grateful to be able to play again I think yeah we all know the well, story you weren't like that when in the middle of the week no after the first match it was rough I lost six in the third to somebody who messaging me throughout the week that you wanted to break shit and I'm like no 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 what do you mean no during practice I was practicing bad when I arrived uh huh I said that yes I said that yes then I lost the first match yeah and I said that yes but after that didn't happen oh did it happen I did have after I lost the blaze. It's true. Please, that's true. <laughs> I don't know who you think you're lying to? But yeah, yeah. I was trying to tell this man like <laughs> it was so weird because he's out there, Davis Cup, and he's lost every match, and I'm saying congratulations. But like, it's yeah. congratulations because you like. It's also just, like five minutes after the match is done that I'm getting a happy for you dog text, and it's like. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what uh, I didn't understand before because I was telling you all week. It's like. Just go and play matches, be healthy, you know? Like, that's the win. Like but you said you didn't get any wins, but that's the win. The win is no, like, no. we're a professional player for I, a week. I was getting to it, but like... Like, you were unemployed for three months, four months. In four theory, months. in theory, that's... And in my intention, that is great. It's good to go out there and play, and just being healthy is, is fantastic. But then you give everything you have in the match... And you come up short because of things, sometimes the things that you feel like you could have done a little bit better, even though you might be out of, let's say, practice or rhythm with those things, it it still hurts. And then you're on a team and you, you're on a no, team. No. How many how many sets did you play before Davis Cup in the last four? That's not what I'm talking about. I understand the scenario. The overall scenario, when I take a step back and I look at it, uh-huh. I understand, yo, you haven't barely trained, you haven't barely played any tennis. So to expect to do very well and to beat people that you may think that you should beat isn't necessarily the right expectation to have, which I didn't necessarily have going into the matches. But it's just once you're in the moment and you're giving it everything that you have for this match and you win winning sets and losing sets and coming back down from breaks and you have chances to, you have too much points in a match and certain things are happening and you're fighting and you're on a team and you, it's intense. It's not like you're just out there playing and lollygagging. It's like, You've given it everything you have, 
that you lose the match, some, it still hurts. It's not like you give everything you have for three hours and you, you lose the last point and it's like, ah, that was fun. Not in the moment. Like, the day after, I can get myself perspective and I, and I feel that, like, the longer I'm away from the matches, the more I appreciate them. But 30 minutes after the match, I'm not happy. And I think that's human as well. I think that that's... How, how did Alberan describe losing... He said he was gutted. Dinner. He was gutted. Yeah. But he had a perspective of that, so he's happy for the guy as well. Yeah. Which I tried to do that myself as well, but I'm also still gutted. It's, it hurt. Yeah. I just played three hours. I, I played three hours. I, I went I through also, seven shirts. Um, I think also, like, maybe my perspective at Davis Cup is a little bit different because I'm from a small country just like you. And I don't know. Bahamas has other players that when they're playing well, they can they can compete at number one as well but Antigua's not the same so if I don't play we lose so I don't. I almost don't feel pressure I almost like I'm all y'all have right so if I come out here and play any win is a win you know like, any win is like we're already doing above like what you always done if I wasn't here so um, I almost don't feel pressure like it, it still sucks to lose but like I feel less pressure than I didn't feel pressure in the sense that like we have to win and I maybe had that feeling a little bit in Costa Rica, which also which also was my first match back, so I didn't really feel it. I was like, I'm playing and I'm just trying to see where I'm at. But I was also in a scenario where I was on a team for the first time in my life probably where I'm the elder and there's some young players that I actually took a liking to when we were out there, like we got along well. I know one of them from he was like eight years old and to see him playing well now, MJ got his first... M- uh, on his debut match against Costa Rica, against a good player, he won his first ever Davis Cup match, which I was very proud of him to see him do that. And in that match, to have two match points against Costa Rica, against a guy who was playing very well, by the way, from my feeling, and he went on to have close matches with other good players that week as well. So I wasn't like it was a bad loss in hindsight, but in the moment, it hurts. And I also want to give that experience to MJ and Denali and Dante that, you know, that that would have been nice to do. So in the moment it hurts, but looking back at it now, not that I don't care, but it's like, yeah, what do you expect? It's like it was a blessing that I was able to go out there and compete for four for four matches. Probably played ten plus hours of tennis in a, in a week, where that hasn't been possible for me since but since maybe January. That's, maybe that's the thing. Like, how long did it take you to have that perspective? Not long. Like how long? Like after the matches. Because I guess next that's, day, that's what that's what maybe then you need to improve. You know, it's like to have that perspective. Like Costa Rica, Shorter, like we finished at one a.m. Uh-huh. I went to bed at two thirty, so I don't think I had that perspective until maybe the next morning when we lost. No, but to, you didn't have that perspective the next morning because you were still furious throughout the week. No, I wasn't furious throughout the week. I was pissed after I lost to Blaze. Uh huh. But when I lost to Ricardo, I wasn't upset. Right. I lost 6-4 in the third day. I wasn't, I wasn't like, I thought, guy played well. Yeah. I fought hard. I was up a set. But then his level wasn't that high. I thought in the first set he was playing pretty spinny, pretty short. I took advantage of that. Um, I think I wasn't that clean sometimes when I would break. I got broke a lot. But I got broken back a lot after I broke, sir, which I wasn't that happy with. But I held, I held through. I won that first set. And then... Yeah, in the second or third, he actually started playing with a lot more depth. He served a bit better. And, yeah, I was outplayed at the end of, the, of those sets. And I probably wasn't as sharp as I should be. But, yeah, he played well. And then against the Paraguay, I thought I played pretty well. Didn't go my way. And then against Blades, I was up. I broke him, I think, twice in each set. And I lost the set. I lost both sets. And that made me upset. I guess it's like... Maybe because I'm defensive of you in a way. So, like, and I'm less emotional about the situation. So, like, how many sets did you play before Davis Cup? Zero. Zero full sets. So, you played zero full sets. If I were to tell you that you go from playing zero full sets in practice next week, you're going to go and you're going to play Ricardo three sets, who's been doing well recently, by the way. The man's been a lot of matches at Futures recently. No, he played at Blaze. He played well. You win. You lose two close sets, but you broke him twice in the set. But all of this happens in practice. You're going to be like, 
It's going to be encouraging. You went from not holding a racket three weeks ago to now playing these matches. So it's like, I don't know. I'm not emotional about it from the outside looking in. It's like, I wish you would have the same perspective. No, I had, uh, I had it, but I had both in throughout the week. Like, there were times, there were short periods of intense frustration after matches, followed by longer periods of, like, perspective. Okay. That's what I'm trying to say. Right. Like, even by the time we got to the airport the night after the loss of Jamaica, so let's say match finished at, like, I want to say 7.30, 8, with the airport by 10, it was really good, joking with everybody, like, whatever. But that that 45 minutes, hour after the match, yeah. I just didn't want you to be unfair to yourself. And I know the kind of person you are. And it's like, I know the feeling of playing Davis Cup, like playing for your country, and now you're playing not only for you and your family, but for other people and other families. So I know the pressure that you're going to feel. Mm -hmm. But I wanted you to almost try your best to put that to the side a little bit because yeah. of the situation. That's that a little bit the funny thing. It's like you go there, no, you knowing, and the people that you're with every day knowing that you haven't done X, Y, Z. And you might tell someone, okay, I just started training, whatever. But yeah, you have family who text you and they say, hope you'll do X, Y, Z. People wishing you all good luck and all these things. And you you can feel that people want you to do well. Yeah. And not that I take that on so heavily, but it's there. It's a it's a real it's a real thing that's a part of the scenario. And disclaimer quickly, I don't want people to get it confused. Like, I don't think you are not prepared. Like don't think that you went and played and you weren't prepared to play. You've been training, you're in shape. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you're not in match form, but I don't I just want to make sure that people watching don't think that you went to a tournament unprepared, you know? Yeah, I mean, listen, I was out maybe 12 weeks where I literally couldn't hold the racket, and I was doing, like, this pretty tough fitness program. I was in good shape when I started hitting. Maybe the first week back hitting, I was playing, like, 30 minutes, 25 minutes a day, sometimes still with pain, and then probably the latter three, two and a half, three weeks, I built up to the point where I was playing... Uh, between two and three hours a day and I had quite a few short sets of tennis where I would play sometimes a few different people in a short set so it was it was just like the full match format and the way a match flows and the rhythm of it is different than playing a bunch of people for short sets but in terms of being able to go out there and last for three hour matches I was able to do it and I did do it four times in, in that week Yeah, and, and yeah Looking at it now, I think for me it was a blessing. I think it it sucks that we have to go down to group four now, but that's just, I guess, another part of the journey, and that's probably a good experience for the younger guys that they will go down there and then hopefully we get back up and hopefully they can do something like what Darian was able to do with his country back in the day and maybe get up into the higher groups eventually as everybody else develops. But, yeah, man, it's, it's good to be able to go on the tennis court and play and that week, not worry about pain at all, has been was a, was a blessing for me. And this week had a couple of times where I felt some pain. So I'm going to Montreal tomorrow, and hopefully things are better. Uh, but I was able to finish my practices this week. And besides one, I had some pain. We wanted to be cautious. So let's see what happens. But uh, overall, happy. Like I can, I can do the thing that I love and for the most part, not be in pain. So that's, yeah. I can't really complain about it. Either. I think that's a great way to end it. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. We're going to be in Montreal next week and we'll have some episodes coming your way. So stay tuned. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. See you all in the next episode. Yeah.